I have always been good with my hands. You know, as in building stuff. Now, my obsession with building things came at a very early age. I remember going on long trips with my parents when I was about five or six years old. My parents would drive about three to four hours, sometimes more, to visit with relatives in New Jersey, New York, and in Michigan. The Michigan trips took about 12 hours, if I remember correctly. They would take turns driving their 1979 Volkswagen 412 station wagon. It was blue, not that that matters or anything. I really missed that car. Anyway, I always told myself that if I ever found another one in good condition, I was going to buy it. So, there I would be, in the back seat of the car, with the back seat folded down, for more room of course, building stuff with my Legos, the whole entire trip. I would build houses, cars, people, things like that, for hours on end. I had about 4,000 individual Legos at the time. I kept them all in two large five gallon pickle buckets that my dad brought home from work. I also had about 25 model kits, you know, the airport, the firehouse, the police station, things like that. After I built the kits, I would put them on display in my room, mostly on shelves mounted to the wall, with a few on my dresser and a couple on the TV stand. I still have them, by the way. No, really, I do. Every single one of them. I've been collecting them since I was a kid. The spare bedroom in my house is completely filled with Lego model kits. My last count was 237. Soon, I'm going to need a bigger house, just for my Legos. Anyway, once I started junior high school, my interest in building grew. Building with Legos just was not enough anymore. I wanted to start building things that people could actually use. I chose woodshop as an elective and started to learn how to build stuff using wood. It was great. I built a birdhouse, a toolbox, and a few other things. Now, I'm not sure how it was, or is, at the high school that you went to or go to now, but when I started high school in the early 80s, you were required each year to take the six major classes. You know, a full year of English, a full year of math, a full year of science, and a full year of social studies, as well as a half year of gym and a half year of health. You were allowed to pick three elective classes to complete your eight class school day, or you could attend a nearby vocational school and learn a trade. So that's what I did. I took, you guessed it, wood shop, well, carpentry to be exact. But this class was on a whole different level. We learned blueprinting, roofing, and how to put on siding. We got to build an entire house, not a shed, but a real house, once we learned how to, that is. That was the class project for the year. Actually, all four years. Wait, I'm lying. The first year, we did build a two-room shed-like structure. The second year, we built a one-bedroom house. The third year, we built a two-bedroom house with a garage. The fourth and final year, we built a two-story house with three bedrooms and a garage. The electrical class and the plumbing class did their thing to the house each year. Then, the school donated the houses to the state. After four years of high school, I got my diploma and my certificate of completion after four years as well from the vocational school and then went to work for a local construction company. I worked there for about two years, but after a near-death experience involving a nail gun, I decided to change my line of work and got a job as the manager of Bob's Hardware, the only hardware store in town. The pay isn't as good, but it's far less likely that I'll get a sleeve of nail shot into my skull, so I'm okay with it. Now, after an in-house investigation 
of the previous mentioned nail gun incident, it was discovered that the nail gun that the guy, Andre Lupo, I'll never forget that name, he worked for a local roofing company. Anyway, it was discovered that the nail gun that he was using was old and very unsafe to use. The safety mechanism on the gun malfunctioned, resulting in about 45 nails to come shooting rapid fire style directly at my head, missing it by mere inches. It was obviously an accident, as Andre and I did not know each other before the incident, worked for two separate companies, and never even spoke a word to each other. But the project manager, I believe his name was Mark or Matt or something with an M, anyway, he didn't see it that way, and had Andre removed from the job site immediately after he finished his investigation. Although I was not injured in the accident, it did scare the shit out of me. I quit about a week after that. Now, fast forward about five years. Like I said, I got a job as the manager of Bob's Hardware Store. I was at work one day, counting inventory on the sales floor. We have to count every nail, every screw, every garden hose, everything, every six months to make sure that the numbers in the computer match the numbers that we have on hand. The owner, Bob, prints out an inventory control report on the computer, which shows how much of each single item in the store that the computer says we're supposed to have. He hands it to me, and it's my job to count it all, and to make sure that the numbers match. If not, then I have to write down the number that we do have in the space provided on the paper. When the entire store is counted, which takes about 8 hours, I have to adjust the numbers in the computer, print out an adjustment report, then try and figure out why the numbers don't match. Theft is a big contributor to the reason why, but that's not always the case. Billing issues, mispicks from the suppliers, damages, among many other things, contribute as well. Anyway, I don't know why I just told you all that. Unless you've been living under a rock, most people already know the process for counting inventory. So, um, moving on. Like I said, I was counting inventory one day. It was a Monday, if I remember correctly. Bob had just told me that he was going to lunch, leaving me to count and take care of any customers. About 10 minutes after he left, I was up front, by the registers, counting the candy, when I saw an old Romanian woman come in and begin aimlessly walking around. I call her Romanian simply because she looked like Count Dracula's grandmother, but I could be wrong. She wore a tan scarf wrapped around her head, a brown and white wool shirt, a long tan patterned wool skirt, black knee-high socks, and black shoes. It was June, about 95 degrees out that day. Now, I don't know if Romanian women sweat, but if they do, she had to be sweating like a pig in all those heavy wool clothes. I was sweating just looking at her. Anyway, I put the ICR, that's the inventory control report, on the shelf next to the garden gnomes and walked up to her as we're trained to do, if we see anyone that looks like they need help. She was in aisle three, standing by the hammers, with her back to me. Hi, welcome to Bob's Hardware. Can I help you find anything? I asked. She turned around, eyes wide. Apparently, I startled her. She threw her arms up in front of her, slumped over, wrinkled her face, curled her fingers like the Wicked Witch did in The Wizard of Oz, and stared directly at me. That startled me. Nah, <laughs> I'm lying. That scared the shit out of me. I took a step back. After a few seconds, she dropped her hands to her side and began to speak. Her English was broken, and I could barely understand what she was saying, between that and her very thick accent. But apparently, she understood English very well. A Sikh Boda! It sounded like she said, 
Boulder, I thought. What? I just looked at her. Boulder! Boulder! She said more intensely and quickly grabbed a hammer off the shelf. Whoa! I exclaimed, putting my hands up in front of me and stepping back even further. I thought she was going to attack me with it. Boulder! Boulder! She said again and swung the hammer in the air, up and down, like it was hitting an imaginary nail. Oh, you mean builder, I said relieved, putting my hands down to my side. You want a builder, someone that builds things. Ya, boda, she said smiling. Apparently, oral hygiene was not a big concern of hers. Anyway, she then put the hammer back on the shelf, stood there, and just stared at me. I build her, I said, tapping myself on the chest. Then I actually heard what I just said. Man, my 10th grade English teacher would gib smack me upside the head if she ever heard me talk like that, I thought. I cleared my throat and corrected myself by saying, I'm a builder. I can build things. What you name? She asked. Douglas. Douglas Wilcox, I replied. I Camilla, she said. She then reached in her pocket and handed me a folded piece of paper. You come, she continued. Today, you come, and then pointed to the paper with one hand and held two fingers in the air with the other hand. Today, I then unfolded it. It was an address. 615 Black Crow Lane. I love the Black Crows. You know, that old 80s rock band? Hard to handle? She talks to angels? Jealous again? Classics. Well, that might have been before your time. So, yeah, moving on. Anyway, the address did not have a city or state written underneath it. So, I assumed it was in this town. As I've never heard of Black Crow Lane before. Okay, I'm off that day. I'll be there, I said, slightly puzzled. What do you need me to build? She did not answer me. She just smiled again, waved, turned around, walked down the aisle, made a left, and disappeared out of sight. I quickly walked to the end of the aisle, looked left, and she was gone. That was weird, I thought, scratching my head and then going back to finish counting. I couldn't get that old woman out of my head. Bob came back from lunch about 20 minutes after that. He was nice enough to bring me a cup of coffee. I love coffee, and by love I mean I'm 100% addicted to the stuff. Coffee is my blood type. I drink coffee like a fish drinks water. Anyway, after another four hours, I finally finished counting and made the adjustments in the computer. I'll research it tomorrow, I told myself. I've had enough for today. I'm exhausted. You know, it's weird. I'm more tired from counting a full inventory than I am from unloading all the lumber trucks. I don't get it. Anyway, I told Bob that I was leaving, punched out, and walked to my truck. At the time, I drove an old Ford F-350, in case you were wondering. Now, on my way home, I decided to stop by the local Goodwill thrift store and look for more Lego kits. Sometimes I get lucky and they have some, but this time, no luck. Anyway, I got home, made a pot of coffee, put a couple of hot pockets in the microwave, waited for them to get done, took them out of the microwave, sat down on the couch, turned on the TV, and watched the Ghoulies movie marathon that I DVR'd the night before. All three movies. I finally went to bed about 10.30. I turned off the TV, turned off the coffee pot, and then went to lay down in bed. Just before I laid down, I put the address into Google Maps. And yes, it was in this town. About a mile away from where I live, there's a road called Dead Man's Lane. About a half a mile down that road, there's a dirt road on your left that extends through the field that surrounds Dead Man's Lane and into the trees behind the field. 
and I always thought it was an access road for the farmer who owned the land. But I was wrong. It's actually a road, Black Crow Lane. Now that I knew where I was going, I shut off the light, laid down, and fell asleep. Sometime in the night, I had the strangest dream. You'll never guess about who. That's right, that old Romanian woman. I was standing in the middle of a cornfield, the midday sun beating down on my head. Now, as I've never been a big fan of cornfields, after watching that Stephen King movie when I was younger, I quickly began walking through the field, trying to find a way out. I walked and walked and walked some more. Suddenly, I heard a voice come piercing through the air like a ghostly EVP. It was a voice I knew. It was Camellia's voice. It said, in that same broken English. I stopped dead in my tracks, shaking in fear. I looked to my left to see every cornstalk within view slowly begin to welt and die as the bright sunny day rapidly gave way to dark menacing clouds. Now standing in the middle of the field, in complete darkness, hearing storm clouds brewing in the distance as lightning filled the skies and the rain began to fall, I took off running. I ran and I ran and I ran. The light from the lightning showed that I was not getting anywhere. It was like I was running on a treadmill. I heard that voice again. I closed my eyes and screamed. When I opened them again, I was standing in an open field, the full moon shining down upon me. The storm was gone and I was completely dry. I looked left, then right, then straight ahead. Only this time, it wasn't wide open spaces that I saw before me. No, it was the old woman. She was standing behind a newly dug grave, a mound of dirt to its left and a shovel to its right. She was holding an old lit lantern. You come, today, she said, and threw the lantern into the grave. Flames then came bursting up from in the hole. You come, she said again, then laughed manically. Her body then became transparent and finally disappeared as the flames engulfed the field. I tried to run, I really did, but I couldn't move. It was like my feet were glued to the ground. The heat from the flames then began burning my skin. I screamed out in pain. I awoke in my bed sweating and screaming my brains out. After a minute or so, I realized that I was not actually burning, composed myself and looked at my phone to check the time. It was 3.48 a.m., the witching hour. It was at that point that I decided not to go back to sleep as I had to be up in just over an hour. I didn't have to be to work until seven, but it takes me about an hour and a half and about three cups of coffee to wake up enough to drive to work. I am not a morning person at all. Anyway, I got up, got dressed, stumbled to the kitchen, put on another pot of coffee, waited for it to finish brewing, and sat at my dining room table, drinking it, trying to wake up. I drink it black, by the way. I finally woke up enough and drove to work. That dream was all I could think about. Bob noticed that I was a little quote unquote off that day and asked what was wrong with me. I told him about the old woman, her request and that crazy dream. He told me to relax and take the rest of the day off as we didn't receive trucks on Tuesday. It's just a backstock day and that he could handle it. I thanked him and home I went. I hung around the house all day long, trying to find things to do, to get my mind off the old woman and that crazy dream. Nothing seemed to work. What did the corn mean? What did the storm mean? What did the field, the grave, and the lantern mean? I thought, 
over and over and over again. Now I was driving myself crazy about it. I fell asleep on the couch early, around 7 o'clock. I was exhausted from stress. I had no dream that night and slept all the way through until about 8 o'clock. I got up Wednesday morning and did my normal routine. As I sat at the dining room table, drinking coffee, I contemplated not even going to the old woman's house. But I told her I would, and I am a man of my word, so I had to go. Now, we never agreed on a time, and I didn't want to show up too early, so I decided to wait until noon. That was a bad idea. The rain began to fall about 10.30. The sky became gray and cloudy, not as dark as the dream, but still close enough. I really didn't want to go at that point. Anyway, 12 o'clock came, I grabbed my wallet, my cell phone, my keys, and my jacket, then made my way to the truck. I put my saw, my measuring tape, and all my tools in the truck, earlier before it started raining. I got in, soaking wet started her up, and drove to Black Crow Lane. I pulled off on the side of the road, just before the turn, and just stared at it for about ten minutes. I took a deep breath, and made the left-hand turn onto the road. It was at that point that I realized that I was glad that I drove a big truck, as the dirt road was consumed with potholes. I bounced around like I was on a damn roller coaster, for God's sakes. The rain and the dirt mixed together, making mud, which caused the truck to slide as well as bounce. I made it down the lane and into the trees, still bouncing and sliding. About a half a mile into the trees, I came to a clearing about an acre wide. There was a run-down shack at the end of the lane, a small patch of corn stalks to the left of it, what looked to be an outhouse just behind it on the right, and a large pile of firewood to the right of it. Old refrigerators, dismantled rusty cars, and various other junk was scattered all around the yard. I stopped the truck and just looked around. It looked like a scene from that movie Deliverance. I just sat there thinking. First, the rain and the clouds, just like the dream. Now corn stalks just like the dream. What's next? I thought. Now, I know what you're thinking. Screw that old lady. I would have just turned around and left. And to be honest, I seriously thought about it. Anyway, I cautiously got out of the truck and began walking to the shack. I knocked on the door. Hello? Camellia? Hello? I said loudly. I knocked on the door a little harder, causing it to swing open. Hello? It's Douglas. Anybody home? I said, pushing the door open and walking in. The interior of the place was a total disaster, far worse than the exterior. Dust, dirt, and cobwebs were everywhere. It looked like no one had lived there for years. I walked in wiping my hand in front of me to knock down all the cobwebs. A dirt cake picture window sat directly in front of me in the living area. Old rickety wooden furniture filled the room. A rabid looking raccoon, well at least I think it was a raccoon, well some kind of fuzzy woodland creature, came scurrying out from under the couch. That thing was huge and very fast. I quickly jumped out of its way as it scurried out the front door, through the yard, and into the trees. What the fuck was that? I said to myself. Anyway, a rust-covered antique refrigerator, broken cabinets, and a good-sized hole in the counter where the sink should have been, and a stove missing the oven door made up the kitchen area to the left. There was a pile of about 15 2x4s as well as five or six sheets of plywood on the floor. What looked to be a brand new wooden door sat on the wall to the right, which I assumed was the bedroom area. My assumption? 
was correct. Hello, I said again, as I opened the bedroom door, saw the bed on the right, and was just about to walk in, when I heard Camellia call my name. Douglas, you come, she said. Yeah, I did, I replied, turning around to see her standing in the doorway, soaking wet in the same clothes that she wore two days ago. That's kind of gross if you ask me, but who am I to judge? Come, she said smiling, and motioned for me to follow her. She then walked into the kitchen area. I followed her, after closing the bedroom door. You, Bill Box, she said, pointing at the stack of wood. Um, you want me to build a box? I asked. She slowly nodded her head. Um, how big of a box? I asked, and spread my arms out side to side. B, like you, she said, and pointed at me. Now, it was at that point that I really started to get concerned. Why does she want a box the size of me? I wondered. Then I thought, maybe she has a lot of books or something that she wants to store away, figuring that I was just being paranoid. Okay, I said, let me get my tools. Dob, open. She said sharply. You want me to leave the top open? I asked, puzzled. Ya, yeah, top open, she replied. Okay, it's your box, lady, I said sarcastically, as I walked outside in the rain to my truck. Beside my truck sat an old Chrysler New Yorker. That thing was huge, with a man about my age in the driver's seat. Not knowing who it was, I waved to him, as I always wave hi to people wherever I go. He did not wave back. He kept his head forward and just stared out the windshield. Shrugging it off, I grabbed my saw and my bag of tools from out of the truck and then walked back inside. Camellia was still standing by the piles of wood. You, Bill, I back two hours, she said. Trying to decipher what she just said, I asked, You want me to build a box about the size of me? You're going to leave and come back in two hours, right? Yeah, she answered, waved, and then left. I watched as she got in the back of the New Yorker. The car then backed up, turned around, and drove off down the lane. It's not going to take me two hours to build a single box, I thought. Then I got to work. I decided to make it two feet wide, two feet deep, and seven feet long, as I am about six foot two. I put the battery on the saw, measured the two by fours, cut them, nailed them together, making the frame, measured the plywood, cut it, and nailed the pieces to the frame all except the top. Just for shits and giggles, I laid down in the box to see if I would fit, and I did. Damn, I'm good, I told myself. Anyway, the whole process took about 45 minutes. I still had over an hour until the old lady returned. I thought about just leaving. Then I remembered she hasn't paid me yet, so I had no choice but to stay. That was a decision that I would later regret. With over an hour to do nothing, I decided to check out the bedroom area. I walked to the door, put my hand on the knob, and turned it. I pushed the door open and saw the bed again. It was an old four-poster bed, with large cobwebs going from post to post, all of them. It looked like mosquito netting, for Christ's sake. The box spring and mattress were completely bare. No sheets, no pillows, no nothing. The mattress had several large cuts in the top of it, with springs sticking out everywhere. There was a small beat-up nightstand to the left of the bed. I walked in the room, turned to my right, to see a just-as-beat-up five-drawer stand-up dresser on the wall in front of the bed, and a broken vanity table that had fallen over just to the left of the dresser, with a small broken mirror above it, 
And by broken, I mean that thing was shattered. Anyway, the entire place was creepy as hell. But the scariest part came next. As I turned around to leave the room, I saw what I can only describe as a scene from Criminal Minds. The entire wall to the left of the door was completely covered in 5 by 7 pictures, newspaper articles, and a handwritten note in a language that I could not read, with a map of the town in the direct center. With a closer look, I discovered that some of the pictures were of me, outside my house, at the gym, at Bob's, in my truck, and many other places. What the fuck? I said to myself, totally freaked out. There were also pictures of two other men at certain places just like mine. One of them I recognized, but I couldn't remember. After a couple minutes of thought, I knew who it was. It was Mark, or Matt, or whatever the hell his name is, the project manager of the construction site. There were large red X's over each picture of him, as well as pictures of a man that I knew I did not know. Red X's over his pictures as well. What the hell is going on here? I thought. Scared, but still intrigued, I began to examine the newspaper articles. Apparently, there were a string of robberies that were committed shortly after I started at Bob's five years ago. The police did have a suspect, as he was clearly identified in a closed-circuit surveillance video leaving Millie's bookstore after robbing it. The article included a picture. It was Andre Lupo. I remembered him immediately. Suddenly, I heard the sound of heavy work boots quickly walking briskly across the wooden floor of the shack, startling me. I turned to look toward the doorway, just as the man that was behind the wheel of the New Yorker came into view. What the fuck are you doing in here? He screamed and charged at me. I put my hands up to try and stop him, but it didn't work. He grabbed me and threw me down hard to the floor and kicked me in the stomach twice. On the third attempt at kicking me, Nye grabbed his leg, twisted it, causing him to fall head first against the dresser. He fell to the floor, dazed and screaming. I sucked up the pain, scrambled to my feet, jumped on top of him, grabbed him by the collar of his shirt, and began pounding my fist into his face. After about the fifth or sixth punch, he stopped moving. I thought he was dead. In fear, I let him go, stood up quickly, ran to the doorway, threw my back against the door, and looked at the body. I noticed his chest was moving up and down, so I knew he wasn't dead, just unconscious. I then attempted to run out the front door. If you noticed, I said attempted. I did not make it out the door. Just as I reached the doorway, Camelia blocked the opening. Her eyes were dark and haunting. She took a deep breath. You pay, she screamed raising her left hand. In it, she held a hypodermic needle, filled with a clear liquid. I looked at the needle. Fuck you! I screamed and tried to push her out of the way. Apparently, she saw it coming, stepped back, causing me to only push air, and plunged the needle deep into the side of my neck. I screamed out in pain. Almost immediately after, my vision became blurry, my equilibrium began to fail, and I felt myself losing consciousness. Right before I passed out, I muttered one word. Why? I awoke to several hard smacks to my face. Wake up! I heard an angry man's voice say. Wake the fuck up! A groggly came to and opened my eyes to see that I was now outside and the daylight had given way to dark nighttime skies. The rain had stopped, and the ground and everything around it was completely dry. How long have I been out? I thought. 
In the moonlight, I saw the man that just attacked me, standing over me. I shook my head to shake the cobwebs loose. He then quickly grabbed me by the hair and thrust my head backwards. You want to know why? Do you want to know why? He screamed in my face. Well, I'll fucking tell you why. He then screamed and thrust my head forward, then stepped back. I raised my head and soon realized where I was. I was on my knees in the box. It was at that point that I realized that I did not build her a box. No, I built her a coffin. My coffin. Anyway, the top, a simple piece of plywood, was leaning up against it on the left. My wrists were duct taped together in front of me, and a newly dug grave was to the left of the board. Two mounds of dirt to the left of it, just like in the dream, only this time there were two of them. Camellia was standing off to the side, holding a lit lantern in her right hand, just like the dream, only this time she was holding a black bag, my tool bag, in her left hand as well. She was chanting and dancing in place. She was no longer in the clothes from two days ago. She now wore a jet black robe with a hood. The hood covered most of her face, like the guy in the beginning of the Def Leppard video for the song Rock of Ages. The only reason that I knew it was her was because she was smiling as she chanted, and I would recognize those rotten, decaying teeth anywhere. Now, behind Camellia, I saw that large stack of firewood that I saw when I first pulled up to the shack. Why are you doing this? I screamed. What did I ever do to you? I don't even know you. But I know you. You are the one responsible for my father losing his job. He screamed. Father? Job? I thought. Then I remembered the picture from the newspaper article. Andre? You're Andre's son? I asked, confused. Yeah, and that is my father's mother, he answered, pointing at Camellia. You cost my father his job. He only started there two days before. We were poor, living in this place with no heat, no electric, and no running water. Barely any food. My father had bought that nail gun secondhand at the Goodwill store. Things were looking up for us. My father was so excited as he was going to start making decent money and finally be able to afford a better home for his family. But you ruined all that. The owner of the roofing company fired him after hearing what happened. He was blackballed in this town, the next town over, and everywhere he went. He couldn't find work anywhere. He couldn't even get a job as a fucking grave digger at the fucking cemetery. With no money to support his family, my mother, his mother, and myself, he became depressed and desperate. Out of desperation, he began robbing stores, never hurting anyone, just to get enough money to feed us. I didn't remove him from the site. I didn't fire him. I had nothing to do with that. The project manager and his boss did all that. I yelled back. Well, who do you think is buried next to you? He said. I looked to my left. Now, what I thought were mounds of dirt from this hole was not. They were graves, and the other two men were buried in them. I screamed, Oh my God, let me out of here! And attempted to get up. Again, if you noticed, I said attempted. Andre's son then punched me in the face. He hit like a little schoolgirl, having little to no effect on me. But I pretended that he knocked me out threw myself backwards into the box and just laid there with my eyes closed. He then bent down beside the box. His voice became louder and closer. We searched for years to find you, having only your name from the suicide note that my father left. 
After months of frustration, my father decided to take his own life to free my mother and I from the shame that he brought upon himself and the struggles that he brought upon our family for not being able to support us. He left a suicide note naming you and the other two men as the reasons why, he yelled. That must have been that note that I saw on the wall, I thought. He killed himself because of you, he yelled louder. Yah, Camellia said from behind him, then went back to chanting. He then stood up as I opened one eye, just enough to see shadows. I saw him grab the board and lift it over his head. Toss me the bag, Grandma, he yelled. The sound of it hitting the ground was heard soon after. Now you're going to die, he screamed, and began to lower the board onto the box. My survival instincts then kicked in. I opened my eyes as I drew my knees up to my chest, screamed, and with every ounce of energy I had, I kicked with both feet against the sheet of plywood as it was coming down, breaking it in two. I quickly sat up to see half of the board hit Andre's son directly in the face, knocking him into the hole head first. That's a six foot drop. A loud thud was heard soon after. Now, again, I know what you're thinking. Where did the other half of the board go? Well, I'll tell you. As Andre's son fell into the hole, I heard Camellia scream, a blood-curdling scream. I looked over to see that the other half of the board had hit her, knocking her down and breaking the lantern. Apparently, the kerosene from the lantern had splashed onto her robe, the ground, and the pile of wood behind her, the flame from the wick igniting all of them. Camellia, the wood, and the ground were now engulfed in flames. Her screams still haunt me to this day. The smell of burning flesh filled the air, and I almost puked all over myself. I fought back to vomit and quickly got out of the box, ran past the grave, past the pile of burning wood and camellia, and then ran to my truck. I opened the driver's side door and got in. I frantically began padding the front pockets of my pants in search of my car keys. There were no keys. Fuck! I screamed. The embers of the flames then began falling on my windshield. It was at that moment that I remembered the first thing that my cousin taught me the day after I got my driver's license. That's right, how to hotwire a car. And that is exactly what I did. I reached up under the steering wheel, found the wires, yanked them free, tapped them together, and bam, she fired up. Thanks, Sandy, I said aloud. My cousin is a girl, by the way. I know, right? Anyway, I reached in the glove box of the truck and pulled out one of my many box cutters that I quote-unquote stole from work. I quickly extended the blade and put it between my knees, blade up. I then cut the duct tape off my wrists. I turned the headlights on, put the truck in reverse, hit the gas, and turned the wheel to the right. The back end of the truck then slammed hard against the side of the New Yorker. Fuck it, I yelled. I put the truck in drive and tore the hell out of there, like Bo Duke from the Dukes of Hazard, The TV show, not that crappy movie. Anyway, I tore down the lane. I completely destroyed my shocks from all the potholes, but I didn't care about that. I got to the end of the lane and made a hard right without stopping the truck sliding sideways as I did. I regained control of the truck and drove to the only place I knew that had a payphone. Barnaby's, that creepy old grocery store in town, as my cell phone was missing from my pocket as well, but not my wallet. Anyway, I called 911 from the payphone, using change that I had in the cup holder of the truck, and reported the fire. After hanging up the phone, I walked back to my truck and just sat there, 
trying to calm myself down. I was shaking like a leaf, sweating and breathing really heavy. That was the most terrifying thing that ever happened to me. It scared me more than the damn nail gun incident. After calming down, I decided to walk into the store and get a cup of coffee, as the coffee shop across the street was closed. I got the biggest cup of coffee they had from the deli, paid for it, and got the hell out of there as fast as I could, as that place creeps me out a lot. I then walked back to my truck. Now, the coffee was really cold, but cold coffee is better than no coffee, right? Right. Anyway, I sat there in the parking lot, drinking the cold coffee, thankful to be alive and thanking God repeatedly for it. I then got to thinking, you know, those two psychos had to be the dumbest con artists slash kidnappers slash murderers that I've ever seen. I mean, first, they left me alone in the place that they were using to plan their crimes, making it really easy for me to discover the truth. Dumb. Second, they took everything from my front pockets, my keys and my phone, but didn't touch anything in my back pockets, namely my wallet, with all my money and credit cards in there. Really dumb. Third, they duct taped my wrist together in front of me. How stupid is that? Fourth, the sun woke me up just to scream at me instead of nailing the top on the box slash coffin while I was passed out from being stuck with the needle, pushing it in the hole and covering it up. Again, stupid. And last, they sedated me when I tried to leave so they could easily put me in the box slash coffin, I assume, but didn't do anything to try and knock me out except that weak-ass little schoolgirl punch when the son went to put the top on. What a bunch of fucking morons, I thought. Am I right? Anyway, I decided not to go home that night and rented a room at the local flop house. Thinking it was Wednesday night, I walked into the office area and discovered that I was wrong. On the counter of the front desk was a digital calendar and clock. It was 9.37 p.m., but it was not Wednesday night. No, it was Saturday night, four days later. I just stood there in shock. I talked to the clerk and got my room. I slept like a baby that night. I got to the room, walked in, and totally collapsed on the bed. I didn't even get out of my clothes. I got up the next morning and immediately went to Bob's praying that I still had a job. I walked in and told Bob what happened. He said that he was glad that I was all right, that he figured I just needed a break from the way I looked the last time he saw me, put me down as being on vacation, and told me to come back to work at 7 o'clock Thursday morning. He's a really nice guy. I thanked him and I left. I then went to the coffee shop across the street from Barnaby's and again got the biggest cup of coffee they had, only this time it was hot and fresh. I stopped by the Xfinity store to get myself a new iPhone. I told the girl behind the counter that I lost the one I had. She said that since I had insurance on my old phone, I could get a new one for free, so I did. I opened it up and downloaded everything I had before from the cloud. Anyway. I then went to the Ford dealership to have them fix the wiring and make a cast of my ignition switch so I could have another key made when you'll never guess what I saw. A blue Volkswagen 412 station wagon for sale on the lot. One of the mechanics owned it. He wanted to sell it and buy a truck. I traded him pink for pink. Pink is 50 slang for a car title in case you didn't know. I got that from the movie Grease. Anyway, I then drove home in my new car. I was truly excited. Now, a newspaper article in the next day's newspaper revealed that a massive fire consumed and destroyed a piece of property located at 615 Black Crow Lane. 
The reason for the fire was still under investigation. It also revealed that the charred remains of two human beings were found at the location, one male and one female. Using DNA and dental records, the bodies were identified as Camelia Lupo, owner of the property, and her grandson, Andre Lupo Jr. I closed the newspaper, sat it on the coffee table, and cried my eyes out after that. Well, I think I'm going to head over to Wally World and check out the Lego kits. It's been a while since I bought a new one. Wish me luck. Thanks for hanging out with me. Bye.